Hello, my name is Clea Schraberg with the ASCD Marketing Team. Welcome to Close Reading, Teaching the Comprehension Skills of Text Analysis and Evaluation. Diane Lapp is Distinguished Professor of Education at San Jose, excuse me, at San Diego State University and a literacy coach at Health Sciences Middle and High Schools. Author of numerous articles, chapters, podcasts, webinars, and books for major areas of research and instruction focused on issues related to struggling learners and their families who live and learn in every community. Barbara Moss is a professor of literacy education at San Diego State University, where she teaches both pre-service and graduate courses in literacy education. During her long career in the public schools, she taught reading or English language arts at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. She has also served as a reading specialist, a reading supervisor, and a high school literacy coach and has worked as a university professor in both Ohio and California. Her research interests focus on children's literature in the classroom, especially informational text, disciplinary literacy, and teacher implementation of instructional strategies. Barbara has published widely in literacy journals and regularly presents at professional conferences on a range of topics including children's literature, close reading, and the Common Core State Standards. Maria Grant is professor in secondary education at California State University Fullerton. She has authored numerous publications centered on literacy, formative assessment, and reading in the content areas, including articles in educational leadership and the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy. Additionally, she is co-author of the books Reading and Writing in Science, Tools to Develop Disciplinary Literacy and Teaching Students to Think Like Scientists, both written with Douglas Fisher and Diane Lapp. Maria teaches courses in the credential and graduate programs at CSC Fullerton and conducts professional development with teachers at various schools across the country. Kelly Johnson, a National Board Certified Teacher, is a Common Core Support Teacher in the San Diego Unified School District where she works in classrooms with teachers modeling how to implement the Common Core strategies across the disciplines and grades. Also a faculty member in teacher education at San Diego State University, Kelly teaches reading methods, classroom management, and liberal studies. She is a recipient of the Constance McCullough Research Award by the California Reading Association for her study on assessment and diagnostic instruction. She also received the International Reading Association Celebrate Literacy Award, which honors educators for their significant literacy contributions. Diane, Barbara, Maria, and Kelly are the authors of the upcoming AACD book, A Close Look at Close Reading, Teaching Students to Analyze Complex Text, Grades K-5, through available for pre-order now through the AACD store. Visit shop.aacd.org and search for Close Reading or any of the author's names to purchase. AACD is pleased to welcome Diane Lapp, Barbara Moss, Maria Grant, and Kelly Johnson. Hello, this is Diane. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our purposes for today, which we address in the form of questions are, what is close reading? What's the difference between a complex text and a difficult text? How can formative assessment help teachers identify the reasons why some students may succeed and some may struggle during a close reading? And finally, what types of instruction support all students both during and after close reading? As we address these questions, our focus will be directed toward Common Core Reading Standard number one. This standard offers the expectation that students will learn to read a text closely in order to determine what the text says explicitly. Doing so involves the reader making logical inferences about the meaning of the text, from the information that is shared within the text, the depth of inference making is very dependent on the language and knowledge the reader has and is gaining about the topic, his understanding of the structure of the genre and his skill as a reader. The learning that results from this reader-text interaction becomes obvious through the written and spoken insights expressed by the reader. The focus on close reading has resulted as attention has been uh, paid to the reading demands of the post-secondary world. Let's explore this chart, which is based on the 2008 findings from research 
done by Williamson to understand the differences that exist between the lexiles or quantitative complexity levels of both high school and post-secondary text. To begin, notice that a lexile score of 1910 exists for many high school texts. GED materials have only a slightly lower score. Notice that there is a 90-point lexile difference between high school texts and SAT materials and military manuals. A difference of 140 points exists between high school texts and newspapers. And a 170-point difference exists between materials found in the workplace and high school. And more than a 300-point difference exists between high school and college materials. And finally, a 200-point difference exists between high school and community college materials. These lexile scores make apparent the disconnect between high school and college and career texts. Think about it. High school seniors who can successfully read 12th grade texts may enter college or the workplace and encounter texts that result in their having less than 50% comprehension. These data make it obvious why literacy must be learned within each discipline. Discipline literacy is not just about learning how the knowledge within a specific discipline is learned and communicated. It's also about how knowledge within a discipline is produced and shared through the use of specific habits and language, practices, processes, skills, and ways of thinking and working that are so unique to the discipline. Such learning, of course, occurs through apprenticeship, as students learn alongside their teachers, the disciplinary experts, to engage in the analysis, argument, and literary use of the information that's so common to the discipline. In grades K through 5, the role of the disciplinary expert falls to the teacher, who begins to help students comprehend what is unique to thinking and talking and reading within the disciplines of science and social studies and language arts. Because standard 10, because of the identified discrepancy and indicated need, there is now also the expectation noted by the uh, common core standards that students will learn to read and comprehend complex literary and informational texts independently and proficiently, and this is standard 10. The process of close reading supports accomplishing this expectation. A lexile score measures only one dimension of text complexity. This is the quantitative dimension, which consists of measurable features such as word length, word frequency, word difficulty, sentence length, text length, and cohesion. This graphic illustrates how these um, lexiles play out across the grade. By the time a student leaves grade five, he should be reading texts that have a suggested lexile between 740 and 1010. Now remember that these lexiles are only, indica in, only indicate um, features of the text that can be quantified or counted. What also must be considered are qualitative features, such as the layered levels of meaning within the text, the structures used by the author to share the information, the clarity um, of the text language and its conventions and the demands of knowledge that are needed by the reader for comprehension. The degree of complexity of these qualitative and quantitative features are always very influenced by the reader, by the reader's cognitive abilities, their reading skills, their motivation and engagement with the text, and their prior knowledge and experience. When observing how students interact with the text as they read and as they annotate and converse about the text, a teacher can determine if they are able to deeply comprehend the text or if during that time it is too difficult for them. 
If the teacher determines that the text is too difficult, he or she will need to design additional or contingent instruction to ensure that the students are able to engage with the targeted text, not leave the targeted text, but engage with it. Contingency instruction, which occurs as, as a response to the observed behaviors of the students, um, ensures that all students will be able to succeed with grade level um, complex text. And a little bit later, Maria and Barbara are going to share with you some um, examples of contingency uh, instruction, one where they stay with the text totally and one where they leave the text and then come back to it. Um, the next Hello everyone, um, this is Kelly, and I'm going to continue this idea of text complexity. Standard number 10 tells us that students need to engage with complex text. And so here is a rubric that you might want to consider when you're evaluating how complex the text is. Diane talked about the three different dimensions that teachers need to think about when they evaluate a text for its complexity, and this takes it a little further. When we're talking about evaluating a text, we can think of kind of three different areas. What does the text say? How does the text work? And then what does the text mean? So going back, we can think of this at, in terms of um, looking at the text in three different areas. You can see the dimensions on the left. In this case, we, we're looking at the meaning and the text structures, so teachers want to pay attention to those two areas when evaluating a text. The considerations are the next column. The scoring. How, how comfortable is this text for your students? So keeping your students in mind when you're looking at a text, you can think, is this easy or comfortable in terms of these different dimensions and considerations? Is it moderate or is it gra at grade level text for them? Or is this really quite a challenge for your students? Or you might want to think about it is, it, is it stretching them? Is it considered a stretch text? So this gives teachers a way to evaluate text in terms of understanding, will it be suitable for my students? Am I about, if I'm about to do a close reading with my students, will this be a text that's complex? And, and maybe most importantly, in what areas is it complex? Is it complex in the meaning area for my students? Maybe it's the text structure. This slide shows maybe it's the language features that might be the, com the area of complexity for my student. Or maybe it's the knowledge demand. So not only is the teacher using this to evaluate the area, but this rubric can really be used as kind of a roadmap for lesson planning in terms of where will I put my emphasis when teaching in this close reading lesson. So we like to use this and encourage teachers to use this so you can kind of mark and maybe circle in the different boxes how your students would, would feel or how this would match up against their proficiencies in terms of the different areas. This is a question we get a lot. How often should my students engage in close reading? Um, we say as much as possible. As, you know, as daily would be wonderful. Um, this kind of gives a chart of you know where you might want to think about doing this. We encourage teachers to do it in different uh, disciplines, in the different content areas. So you might think about planning out your week similar to this. And on Monday, maybe in science you do a close reading lesson. Maybe you do it on the book, Where Do Polar, Bo Polar Bears Live? Maybe on Tuesday you can pick a, a section from your uh, book from Charlotte's Web. Maybe just you know two pages, pages 10 and 11, um, to do a close reading on that text. Um, you can see on Thursday in math, maybe you could do a close reading on a section of the book Warlord's Puzzle. So the idea here is that we can do close readings in different content areas. We can do them on short passages. We should do them on short passages. Um, and so taking a, a 
page or a couple pages in some cases um, will work just, just really well with students and give them exposure to reading text closely in a lot of different content areas. What types of text-dependent questions do you ask during a close reading? This gives some suggestions and, and some ideas of what you might, the kinds of questions you might ask during a close reading lesson. Um, the, these are um, based on a text about light that you might be doing in science. So you might ask them um, during a first read of a, of a close reading, um, you might want to ask students some questions about what does the text say? You might want to ask them specifically some general understanding questions. You know, what's the text, what's going on here? What's the text about? Then ask some key details to kind of lay the foundation, get students um, with that general understanding knowledge that they have. Why are eyes important to creatures like falcons and mice? After they've engaged with the text once, um, you might want to push them back into the text and ask them, some more questions, some more text-dependent questions. So asking questions about how the text works might make sense for a second or third read as you dive deeper into that text. So asking some questions that revolve around vocabulary or the text structure might make sense at this point to push kids back into a deeper understanding of the text. So questions like how does the author explain the meaning of light or what sequencing language does the author use? to describe the path of light from an object to the eye might help students dive deeper, dig deeper into that close reading text so they really have an understanding of how the text works. And finally, you might want to ask a question, some questions about what the text means. Um, asking questions about author's purpose, inferences, opinion questions, argumentation questions might give students that really thoughtful, critical understanding of what's going on in the text at a very deep level. Um, asking these kinds of questions at the onset might not work for most of your students. I know this happened to me when I asked students some of these um, argument and opinion questions um, right after we did a first reading of the text, and I hadn't thoughtfully laid the foundation with some of the um, how does the text work, um, and some of the general understanding types of questions before leading up to this. So this progression really is important. Here's a close reading planning guide. Um, it's small, <laughs> and, and we recognize that. But it has two sections. It has a pre-planning section and then a close reading section. And it takes the teacher through the process of planning a close reading, looking at this area of text complexity, in terms of literary or informational text. It gives step three shows the progression of text-dependent questions that you might want to consider. And then it takes teachers through the close reading lesson um, kind of step by step, what you might do after the first read, um, what you might do after the second read, uh, reminding teachers that uh, partner talk and conversation is a critical piece of this. So this guide is, is helpful for teachers as they plan their close reading lessons. There's also a writing extension area at the end where we would um, assess, um, extend some of the, the work and the thinking that was done around the close reading text. We've got to model. We've got to model how close reading works with students. We can't expect to give them a complex text and expect them to unlock the meaning of it without proper modeling. So it, it's essential that we do that. We've got to model how to annotate a text. What does that even look like? We can't just pass text out to kids and expect them to know how to, monitor, how to annotate and monitor their thinking by writing down um, ideas, questions, and wondering and margin notes on their papers. So we have to model this. You can model this through Think Aloud and really show kids how it is that we're unlocking the meaning. We might want to model our first, how we go about reading it for our first read, what discussion might look like, what the next reading might look like, and then more discussion, 
and then subsequent readings after that. A great way to do this could be through a fishbowl experience. When kids are first trying this on, uh, invite your students to do a fishbowl. Have a group of students in the middle, so that group of students that can really talk about a text. And then we'll have the other students watch, watch them for, to see the kind of language and the kind of critical thinking that goes on in a close reading text. We need to support our students with listening and speaking opportunities and written communication um, when they closely read a text. Some of this might come during a close reading. Some of this might come after a close reading. But these are just some of the ways that we can get kids talking, listening, writing about what they've just read. They've got to try on and really own some of the language from the text. And these are some great strategies, interactive ways that students can get um, more familiar and really go to a deeper level with the reading that they're doing. Mm This is Barb Moss. <clears throat> um, I'd like to talk now about the differences between text complexity and text difficulty. We've shown you, <coughs> excuse me, we've shown you on the rubric how you can evaluate text complexity by examining the um, text in relationship to the different dimensions. But always in our mind is the role of the reader. What does the reader bring to the task? And how does that impact how they're going to perform with a particular text? So as we think about text difficulty, we think about our students. What, and we also not only have to think about our students you know, globally, but also as individuals. So what background knowledge do they bring to the task? What do they know about the topic? Have they encountered this text structure before? For example, many students are very familiar with a sequential structure. They've learned that probably since the first grade. But what about a problem solution structure, which is a much more challenging structure for our students as a general rule? Also, the language, the language related to the topic or content area, the academic terms that they're likely to encounter the actual vocabulary, the construction that the text uses. All these nuanced aspects of language uh, influence how well the reader is going to be able to comprehend the text that we're using for a close reading. And again, remember it is a complex text. A third area that we always have in our mind is the level of fluency. With our children, say, in second grade, they may not be extremely fluent readers at this point, which may interfere with their ability to comprehend the text. Also, in terms of reading skills, comprehension. As we all know, comprehension is more than just figuring out what the text says. It's very important that students be at these higher levels of comprehension, inferring, analyzing, summarizing. And for some students, um, some students may have very strong literal comprehension, but much weaker comprehension at those higher levels. And the whole importance of instruction here is to bridge the gaps that the student may possess, the gaps between the student's abilities and that complex text that you're using. OK, as we think about these instructional next steps, what can you do when the text is too difficult for some students and a perfect stretch for others. So for some students, you may incorporate special extension activities for those students for whom the stretch text is really very easy. I think we often forget about those students who can be pushed even more deeply beyond the text. Uh, whole group activities always are important. Uh, very important, especially in, in a diagnostic sense, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then small group activities. 
what can you do for those students who need additional help with the complex text? Or what can you do to expand the experience in small groups for students for whom appropriate uh, additional experiences are needed? Um, let's go into a classroom. In this case, we're going to look at a classroom, a fourth grade classroom. This is Jackson, who has diverse, a diverse student population, many English learners, and her students are learning about the gold rush era. Um, the standards that we're looking at include determining main idea and explain how it's supported by key details and summarization. Also, if you look at the social study standards, in this case we're looking at the causes and nature of movement of large groups of people into and within the U.S. now and, in this case, in the past. Okay, so how does Mrs. Jackson approach these standards? Her lesson purpose is to have students identify the reasons settlers moved from the east to the west. She's starting out with a stretch informational text. This is a, a, a children's trade book, The California Gold Rush from the Cornerstones of Freedom series. She knows that this is going to be a challenge for some students. So in her pre-planning, pre she has identified an easier companion text that you'll see uh, how we will use it in just a few minutes. So during the first close reading, she gives students an independent reading experience. She sets it up by saying, today we are going to think about the reasons settlers moved from the east to the west coast of the United States. Think about what you learned, what words and phrases you know, what words and sentences you don't know, and what you learned from your partner after reading the text. I want to remind you that this is an excerpt from this text, just a couple pages. It's not the entire trade book. So after this first reading, students completed a response guide on which they recorded their thoughts. And here's what the response guide looked like, what I've learned. And they record some things that they learned, including page numbers, hard words that I know having students self-identify challenging vocabulary, hard words and sentences I don't know, and page numbers, new ideas I learned from my partner. In response to this response guide, students share with the partner what they learned from the text. So after rereading for different purposes, as with the text-dependent questions we showed you earlier, Students reread to answer this text-dependent question, which really gets at the heart of her lesson. Why did settlers move from the east to the west coast? Find phrases and sentences in the text that give evidence for your answer. And the students shared with their partners. Mrs. Jackson is paying attention. She is constantly assessing as students talk to their partners. She walks around. She may record notes on this. Most students identified these reasons and evidence pretty successfully. And they went on to the next task, which was writing a summary of the passage. But some students encountered difficulty with these tasks. She put together pieces of evidence. She noted that some students identified a lot of difficult words on the response sheet. She noticed that some students could not identify why the settlers came to the West or give evidence for their answers. Or maybe some kids could tell why, but could not provide evidence. Um, also, some of her students had background knowledge issues. They confused the time period with colonial times, a time period that they had studied earlier. So, what did she do? She decided to move to an easier text on the same topic. We call it a Tier 1 text. Um, students, she had prepared this in advance, as I said. So students read an excerpt from a less difficult text, a less complex text, an excerpt from the history of us with the same content but and some similar vocabulary, but with somewhat easier structures. 
Students worked on the key terms that were common to both texts. They created word cards where they identified the word through a picture, uh, came up with their, their own definition, and so on. She thought aloud for the students about how to identify main ideas and evidence with the text. And she returned to the stretch text and experienced success. So here's how this worked. She started them off in the most challenging text to see where they were, to see their areas of need. Then she moved them to the simpler text to provide the scaffolded or contingent instruction that they needed. Then she took them back to the most challenging text. And at this point, the students experienced success because they'd had modeling, they'd had vocabulary scaffolding, they had gotten what they needed from their teacher in terms of bridging the gap between where they were as readers and this challenging text. OK, as you think about planning your next steps, you start with your text-dependent questions. You carefully observe and assess, with, and you record anecdotal records on a form like this or one of your own making. Who's confused? What are their misconceptions? For example, the confusion over the time period uh, would be a good example of a misconception. Then you may change your text-dependent questions to help students to dig deeper, to help them negotiate the complex text. Hello, this is Maria. Um, we are going to go into the classroom to look at a classroom in which some of the students struggle a little bit with the text, but instead of bringing in another text, the teacher um, takes, that, takes hold of that instructional moment and moves the students forward um, by teaching them a little bit about the content and by um, helping them to draw on some background knowledge. So let's go into Mrs. Lee's fourth grade classroom. Uh, she has a diverse student population. Most are English learners. And like many fourth grade students, they love to learn about animals. The um, standards that Mrs. Lee is covering are the um, College and Career Readiness Anchor Standard R1 in which students are required to read closely to determine what the text says explicitly and to make logical inferences from it. They're citing specific textual evidence when writing or speaking to support conclusions drawn from the text. Additionally, they are reading informational text and addressing the RI 4.2 standard to determine the main idea of the text and explain how it is supported by key details. And they are summarizing the text. Um, while covering those common core ELA standards, they are also addressing the next generation science standards for life science in fourth grade, 1.1, to construct an argument that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. And um, you know, as preparation for addressing that next gen science standard, they clearly have to be able to build some background knowledge around um, looking at internal and external structures that function to support um, animal survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. So let's take a look at how Mrs. Lee approaches this. OK, so uh, Mrs. Lee develops a first reading using the book um, Horses by Seymour Simon, which is a Common Core text exemplar that you would find in Appendix B of the Common Core State Standards. She has developed an approach, um, a purpose statement, to understand how animals are classified by structures and features. And clearly, that correlates with the content standard that she is addressing. 
she delves in with her first reading. This is an independent reading for students. Um, she knows that that first reading often entails some struggle and some challenges, so she um, encourage, encourages her students by saying, um, you know you're going to encounter some new words and unfamiliar phrases. Remember to persist, keep going, keep reading to understand. And then she provides them with this um, text-dependent question. What information is Seymour Simon sharing in this text? So that's that first reading where students independently read. Um, after students read, they partner share so that Mrs. Lee can um, implement her formative assessment. Um, she listened in as they were talking, and she was secure that they were comprehending, so she decided to persevere with the next question and focus very strategically on structure and language of the text delving a little bit deeper and uh, trying to help her students go further with this text. Um, so she asked this question, which also addressed the idea that um, in science we utilize classification systems to, to organize. So here's the question that she asked. Now I'd like you to focus on the technical terms used to describe the look of horses. The author Seymour Simon mentions several names for horses that are based on their coat color and markings. What are these big classifications, and how does the naming of horses based on coloring compare to other classification methods that we've studied in science? So knowing that um, classification is a primary organizational system in science, and knowing that the author also addressed this, she presented this question. So listening in as two students, Lila and Marta, discussed, um, you can see that Mrs. Lee did some thinking and some formative assessment and had to make some instructional decisions. She captured the instructional moment. So uh, here's a little bit of the dialogue between Lila and Marta. Um, how can naming horses by color be like classifying animals and plants into different, different kingdoms? Is it like how we put different kinds of rocks into groups, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic? I'm not really sure about this. And then her partner, Marta, responded, look at all the names of horses here, bays, chestnuts, palominos, roans, duns. I didn't know there were so many horses. I thought they were all just called horses. Um, Mrs. Lee, not sure that Lila and Marta were actually making you know, the appropriate and uh, deep level connections that she wanted made some decisions about her next steps for instruction. Um, she also noticed that most students tackled the question. So she moved most of the students on to the next question, which was how does the author classify horses in this text? Um, she also asked that as they read the text and addressed this question, that they drew and labeled features of different horses, different kinds of horses. Um, working with a partner, she had um, one focus on the um, screwballs and pieballs, and then another partner focused on the chestnuts and the brown bays. And they compared the differences and labeled using information in the text. But then going back to um, Marta and Lila's conversation, Mrs. Lee knew that they needed a little bit more. So while the others were working on um, classification and going deeper with all those different kinds of horses, she sat down with Marta and Lila and reminded them of how they had previously classified rocks in, in um, previous studies. So she pulled out a semantic feature analysis chart in which the students had described igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks, how they formed um, various characteristics of them, and then discussed how classification involves identifying features of different objects or organisms in science, and then seeing how they could be grouped. She then asked students to think about how this could be applied to the classification of horses in the text. 
So here's a little bit of, of the conversation in which Mrs. Lee grabbed that instructional moment to guide students towards learning. Um, why do we put some organisms into the kingdom of plants and some into the kingdom of animals? Why are some rocks metamorphic and others igneous? And here's what Marta said. Because they have things in common with the group they are in, all igneous rocks are from lava or magma, and all metamorphic rocks are changed from heat or pressure. Is that right? And they had that semantic feature analysis to remind them of this. Um, then Mrs. Lee confirmed and said, that is right. OK, now look at the text again. Do all piebalds have something in common, something other than being horses? Do all pintos have something in common? And Lila, getting this, says, yes. All pintos are partly colored, and all piebalds have black and white patches. They have something in common when they have a name like piebald. That's what classification is all about, having something in common. I've got it now. Um, and Mrs. Lee, you know, feeling pretty good about this instructional moment, says, Marta and Lila, now you can move on to the drawing and classification task. So you can see she took that moment to instruct students that needed a little bit more support. And this protocol for implementing close reading allows for teachers to do that, to really be able to capture what students understand and don't understand, and then move them forward. So thinking about close reading and stepping back and looking at the big, big picture and trying to figure out how can this really work in a school setting. Um, well, administrators can clearly play a huge role in supporting whole school implementation of close reading. Um, how can they do this? Well, they can become informed of best practices, research-based best practices in uh, close reading. They can schedule and attend workshops to support teachers as they implement close reading so that administrators are really a part of this whole school effort. You know, lending a face and actual support to something like this is really powerful. Um, this takes time. Implementing whole school close reading takes time. It takes planning. So for administrators to work some of that planning time into the schedule or to schedule teachers so that they can collaborate together, um, again, can be a very powerful effort. Um, as you know, annotation is a huge part of close reading. So getting together, maybe during some of this planning time that's allotted by the administrators for teachers and administration to decide on school-wide, grade level, or even department, you know, math department or, uh, you know, third grade level um, annotation can really be powerful. If students don't have to relearn different systems of annotation, it's easier for them to move forward with a system that is common among the department, the grade level, or the whole school. And then because close reading takes some reflection on the part of the teacher, um, having some coaching available for teachers as they try on close reading, um, coaching that allows you know, reflection on implementation and rethinking of strategies that might work a little better or thinking about what was successful can really be powerful. And then arranging opportunities for peer observation and feedback, um, again, can be powerful. Facilitating conversations uh, is something very meaningful for teachers and ultimately for students as well. Um, we have provided here a guide sheet for observations. Um, if you look at this is the first of two pages here, um, you'll see there are just some things at the top to think about. Um, when close reading is implemented, you know, you've noticed that we've set the purpose throughout this presentation, and we've talked about teachers setting the purpose. Setting the purpose for students in the classroom is critical. So if a coach or an administrator or a peer is observing a teacher, they might be noting things like, is the purpose statement posted? Is um, a short, complex passage used? And I'm looking at the top of this guide sheet here. Um, is the passage numbered so that when students are talking about the passage, they can reference in, you know, paragraph two or passage two, I notice this. Um, is there an annotation chart posted? And is it clear that students have been taught how to annotate? 
is front-loading limited? Because in close reading, we want students to wrestle with the text and struggle a little bit and persevere. Uh, is the teacher asking text-dependent questions that drive the students back to the text? Is partner talk um, involved so that the teacher can implement some formative assessment and so that students can negotiate meaning and share ideas? And then is some writing or some closing task involved to extend meaning? So this is kind of the general setting in which the close reading is um, implemented. Then there are some questions to consider. Is the purpose addressed throughout the lesson? What text-dependent questions are asked? How is partner talk used to enhance understanding? And are insights gained from students' responses used to scaffold follow-up questions, discussion, and instruction, as you saw um, Ms. Lee doing? And then there are sections for the various close readings. And we don't advocate for a particular number of close readings. It really depends on the student and on the text complexity. You may have two, three, four, maybe even more close readings. But we've got some space allotted here for comments as an observer or a coach or a peer um, observes first reading, second reading. And then you'll see on the next page of this form, uh, third reading, fourth reading. And then we always like to think about what are the next steps. So there's a section here for focusing forward. So we've covered a lot in this uh, webinar. Hopefully we've given you some, some really good things to think about um, and reflect on. If you have any questions, we're monitoring the chat box, and we're happy to address those. But we thank you very much for your the comments that you have presented in the chat box and for your efforts with students in the classroom, and if you're administrators, for your work with teachers, which ultimately means you're working with students as well. So thanks for joining us, and um, we appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much, ladies. That was a fantastic conversation. It feels like we just started a couple minutes ago as we're following through your rubrics and through your classroom examples, and it's been a really, really fun time. So I noticed that there were a lot of questions that were popping up through the chat, and some of them you were addressing as they came in. Since uh, some people may not have seen the chat, since it did move so fast, and also the chat isn't captured on the recording of the presentation that we'll be sharing on ASCD's website. Are there a couple questions that did come through these that would be really nice for everyone to hear what your response was to them? Uh, yes, one of the questions that came through, can, this is Diane, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, one of the questions that came through, um, I think that it was interpreted that we were suggesting that you would move the reader away from the text. And what we are suggesting is that that, that is not what should happen. All children should be introduced to the uh, complex te text and that the teacher would have prepared in, uh, questions that help the children to explore what the text means and the structure of the text and how it is presented and what it's saying. Um, they would engage in annotations and collaborative conversations. And the whole time that they would be doing this, the teacher would be very observant of their participation and behavior. Um, however, if the teacher sees that one or two children at the end, even with all these supports, are struggling so much that they have not comprehended what the text means. There has to be further analysis about what's missing. Do these children not have the background knowledge? Do they not have the language? Do they not understand the structure of a poem or a graph or whatever the text was that they were reading? And it is only at that time that the teacher may call a small group of children, or the, the two or the one who are, is having this difficulty, and with them explore either the same initial text to look at those components, or perhaps um, believing that she may have a couple children with this type of um, difficulty, perhaps she selected a text similar to it that scaffolds this information. And then, of course, they go back to the original complex text. We are not suggesting in any way that they have only access to less difficult texts. Our goal is that all children learn how to read 
the most complex text within their grade level band. And it's up to us as teachers to ensure that that happens. And I think that's the big question that we were being asked because we were talking a lot about contingency instruction. And we were doing this because as we're working in close reading in our classrooms, we're seeing that children do need some additional support after, not before, no front loading before. So um, I, I hope that clears that up a bit. A bit. Great. Um, Maria or, or Kelly or Barb, anything that you thought was uh, of note in the questions? And I'm also um, uh, putting some more questions in that came through our chat uh, and Q&A pane. Um, another question that just came through that I would like to address is um, we're being asked if we think the vocabulary should be taught prior to the reading. And no, we do not think this. We think that children should have a chance to look at the context of the passage. And authors often give us ways to understand language uh, within a passage. And so some of the, when the teacher's preparing this lesson and is previewing the text, um, she can prepare questions that push them to look at the vocabulary. Um, but no, there should not be that kind of front loading done when it's during a close reading. The questions should push children to areas about language and structure and um, text meaning and information. But no, there should not be front loading about vocabulary. OK, so a question has just come in, uh, and I don't think it's been addressed, but where does the enjoyment of reading come in? I have found that when students are required to annotate, they no longer like to read. I have also seen that good readers do not like to spend forever on a few pages. They want to read the whole thing. Can you speak to that? Well, you know, this is only one type of reading that you're doing in your classroom. So in our classrooms, we're still doing um, sustained silent reading, where children have independent time to choose books and do you know lots of different kinds of reading. Close reading, as Kelly pointed out in showing the schedule, is only one type of reading that they're doing. And it's, um, you know, can also be in very enjoyable texts. I know that in teaching science, many of my students you know, love to read science passages. Um, and we talk with them about them as they're reading them. And they you know, are enjoying those. And you know, along those lines, I would just like to add as well that um, the partner talk that we advocate for in close reading really helps to up the enjoyment factor. Um, you know, students realize they can unlock and understand some of these complex texts that before they thought they really couldn't. So having them work with partners and then you know, when the teacher strategically develops a text-dependent question that is designed to help them unlock meaning, um, they really seem to enjoy it. So it's surprising that something that, you know, at, at first thought seems very tedious and, um, you know, fraught with struggle can really be enjoyable if the teacher is strategic and attentive and, and implements that formative assessment to help students unlock understanding. All of a sudden, they're, they're realizing, wow, I really do like reading about horses, or I really do like reading about you know, momentum or something that, that you would think would be kind of dry. The understanding piece really parallels enjoyment. So we have a lot, uh, a number of questions that I keep uh, adding to our chat window. If you would like to take a look, what yeah. I can tell, uh, well, for uh, just uh, for all of our attendees, and I'll mention this again in a couple minutes, we uh, will be sharing the handouts. And, and I understand that a lot of you think that the font on the handout for the rubric is too small. Uh, if that is the case, then um, we will make sure that we upload a larger version of that for you. So you should see that reflected in uh, the follow-up email that you receive. If you have any questions about that, you can always contact us at webcontent at ASCD.org. That is W-E-B-C-O-N-T-E-N-T -E -E at ASCD.org. And just let us know uh, which of the slides that you're looking for. OK, back to you, ladies. I just want to um, address this question about close reading um, in the primary grades and in kindergarten. Um, the teacher can do the reading. Um, for the students, 
um, with the students, but really get the students to do the close thinking. Um, really engage them in those text-dependent questions and push them back into the text so that the, the teacher can do the decoding, but let's get the kids thinking about that text and dive deeper into that text as listeners. Um, the other question is coming up about um, the why text-dependent questions. Why not take them further away, make that application and that transfer? Um, and the truth is that sometimes kids go off on the tangents, and sometimes we ask questions that don't require students to back up what they're saying with the evidence from the text. So by using the text-dependent questions, we want to push kids back into the text to support their claims and their arguments and their ideas with evidence from the text. Yes, we're still going to ask some text-independent questions. I think that's just in our nature as teachers. But let's not be so far removed from the text that our questions and our responses go so far away that it doesn't require students to read the text or think about the text with evidence. OK, I think we have uh, time for one more question. If you ladies have one that you'd like to answer. I would like to answer the one there that is being asked about the vocabulary in the primary grade. Again, um, when the text is being read by the teacher or read by the children, don't front load the vocabulary. Um, the questions that we ask children should invite them to consider what those words mean within the context of the text, helping them to use the context clues that the author has given. If at the end, however, this is what we were suggesting, that you see that a few children are struggling with this, this is the perfect time for a small group instruction. But it's after they have the initial opportunity to grapple with the text. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank our presenters, Diane Last, Barbara Moss, Maria Grant, and Kelly Johnson for sharing their expertise with us today.